Good evening. Welcome. I'm Joe Green, the Assist Deputy Director and Curator of the Smithic Museum at Harvard. Uh, welcome to this, another in the museum's series of lectures on the civilizations of the ancient Near East, brought to you by the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. It's my pleasure to introduce to you this evening my colleague and good friend, Michael Coogan. Dr. Coogan is Director of Publications for the Smithic Museum and lecturer in Old Testament Hebrew Bible at the Harvard Divinity School. He's also taught at Stonehill College, Boston College, Wellesley College, Fordham University, and the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. Over the years, he's participated in and directed archaeological excavations in Israel, Jordan, Cyprus, and Egypt. He is the author, most recently, of A Brief Introduction to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible in its context, The Old Testament, A Very Brief Introduction, and the Old Testament, Historical and Literary Introduction to the Hebrew Scriptures, and is editor of the New Oxford Annotated Bible and the Oxford Bible Studies Online. Uh, you detect a pattern here. Uh, <laughs> this has all made him uh, one of the leading biblical scholars in the U.S. today. You might also be interested in his 2010 book, God and Sex, What the Bible Really Says. Uh, which unaccountably he left out of the blurb he gave me for this introduction. Um, it is, I understand, a hot item. Uh, Dr. Coogan has written and edited many scholarly articles and numerous other books, and has appeared in such programs as NOVA's The Bible's Buried Secrets, which in fact I think was filmed in the first floor gallery of the Smithic Museum, uh, where the lecture, uh, the reception after this lecture will be held. I've never had the opportunity uh, to be his student, but he has taught a number of friends of mine, either in the classroom or in the field. I do, however, consider him my mentor as an academic editor, first and most notably 20 years ago when I served as managing editor for the Scripture and Other Artifacts, the Feshrift presented to Philip King, now Professor Emeritus of Boston College, and the namesake of the King Chair, now held by the museum's director, Peter Demanueli. He, Michael was one of the book's senior editors. I have never known him to be at a loss uh, as to where to put a comma or a diacritical mark, although excellence in academic editing is, never, is more than merely following the latest edition of the Chicago Manual of Style. It requires a deep erudition in the subject matter, something Michael possesses in abundance. I am grateful you've all joined us here tonight. Uh, there is, I understand, a competing event sponsored by the Humanities Center, its director, Homi Baba, is interviewing the filmmaker Steven Spielberg. So if you've come looking for the lecture on the Ark of the Covenant, you're in the wrong place. That's on uh, Brattle Street at the Loeb Center. Here tonight, the topic is the contents of the Ark, the Ten Commandments, a short history of an ancient text. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Coop. Thank you, Joe, for that very warm introduction. Tis the season for the Ten Commandments, right? Some of you probably saw it this weekend. Um, and this is a familiar picture. Um, look this. But this is a little less familiar, although the character on your left <laughs> will be recognizable. And this was June 10th, 1956, in North Dakota, a sunny day, as you can see. And there, Charlton Heston on the left, and on the far right, a man named Judge E.J. Rugemer were dedicating a monument of the Ten Commandments. Rugemer was a juvenile court judge who, since the 1940s, had led the campaign of a civic association called the Fraternal Order of Eagles to combat juvenile delinquency to combat juvenile delinquency by putting a copy of the Ten Commandments into the hands of every teenager. And um, Cecil B. DeMille joined the Eagles campaign just as he was producing and then promoting his film. And so he arranged and paid for public monuments like this one to be erected all over the country and the film stars appeared at uh, the dedication of several of the monuments. So this sincere, if somewhat naive, campaign was co-opted by Hollywood PR. Some of these monuments, sponsored by the Fraternal Order of Eagles, and there are now several hundred of them, 
um, and other public displays of the Ten Commandments have been subjects of court cases, including Van Orden v. Perry. Uh, an avowed atheist, Thomas Van Orden, sued the state of Texas in the person of its governor, Rick Perry, Van Orden v. Perry, uh, because on the grounds of the state capitol in Austin was this monument of the Ten Commandments, very similar to the one we saw in the previous slide. Uh, and this monument, erected in the 1950s, was also funded by the Fraternal Order of Eagles. Perry argued, I'm sorry, uh, Van Orden argued that it violated the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, uh, that it amounted to government endorsement of religion. And the Supreme Court decided this case in 2005 and ruled that the monument was constitutional and so could remain because said the majority opinion, religion in general and the Ten Commandments in particular were part of the heritage of the United States. And besides, the purpose of the monument was more historical than religious. But in other cases, also involving display of the Ten Commandments, uh, both lower courts and the Supreme Court itself have ruled that displaying the Ten Commandments for explicitly or other explicitly religious texts is uh, unconstitutional. The main exception, the court said, is when the display of the Ten Commandments is part of a display of great laws or great lawgivers of history. And in his concurring opinion to this case, Justice Breyer argued that this monument had been there for so long that it had become historic just for having been there for 40 plus years. But let's look at this monument more closely. So in the top, you can make out the great seal of the United States, which you see on a $1 bill. There is the uh, eye of providence in a triangle representing the Christian Trinity. That's the back of the great seal. And then under the eye of providence is the eagle holding the American flag uh, in its claws. Um, so this is an American monument. It's not just a Ten Commandments monument. Um, in the upper corners are, is the text, the Hebrew text, like the one shown in the previous slide. The script is improbable, but I suspect that it was the same scribe who wrote this version and the one <laughs> that Charlton Heston carried down from the mountain. I recognize the handwriting. Anyway, this is the stylized, <laughs> stylized uh, Hebrew script of the Ten Commandments, abbreviated. And um, balancing those in the bottom corners of the monument are two Jewish symbols, the Star of David, and in the center, the intertwined Greek letters, chi and rho, the first two letters of the title Christ. Now let's consider the text of the Ten Commandments on this monument. It is severely abridged. It is stripped of all of the particulars that in the Bible make it a very Israelite text. Gone is God's self-identification as the one who brought the Israelites out from the land of Egypt from the land of Egypt, from the house of slaves. Gone, too, are the theologically challenging descriptions of God as one who punishes sons for their father's sins to three and four generations. As we will see in a moment, the Sabbath commandment is also severely abridged. Finally, I should note that, I don't know if you can read this for you, but it says, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his man-servant, nor his maid-servant. This is the venerable King James Version, um, but the Hebrew word means actual slaves, as the Israelites had been in Egypt. The only commandment that's not abridged is the commandment concerning parents. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And in its context on this monument, under the great seal of the United States and the American flag, it could easily be misunderstood not as the biblical promised land of Canaan, but the providence plantation of the American people, the new Canaan. 
So these monuments, and as I said, there are hundreds of them like it, are very, are hybrids. They're very American, very Christian. They're both secular and sacred. And their content, which we'll say more about, and their placement in public spaces, rather than in houses of worship, seems to suggest that the Ten Commandments is one of the foundational American texts, which is in essence a Christian, or at least perhaps a Judeo-Christian nation. I should also point out that, of course, the commandment says, thou shalt not make an image, and the eagle itself violates that uh, <laughs> command. So is this ancient set of biblical laws an appropriate American symbol? Are its values easily transferable to our context? I'm reminded of a remark of Peter Brown, the historian of late antiquity that I read recently. Antiquity is always stranger than we think. And nowhere does it prove to be more strange than where we once assumed it was most familiar to us. I have another reason for objecting to displays of the Ten Commandments. Not only do they significantly abridge them, but the text selected for display is arbitrary. Because there are in the Bible three versions of the Ten Commandments, not just one. According to the book of Exodus, the Ten Commandments were given by God to the Israelites at Mount Sinai seven weeks after the escape from Egypt. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, some 40 years later, we're told, Moses recapitulates all the laws that had been given on Mount Sinai and repeats the Ten Commandments along with other laws. And although the versions in Exodus and Deuteronomy are substantially the same, they are not identical. There are a couple dozen mostly minor differences between them, but some of the differences are significant. And one concerns the last commandment. Uh, so the Exodus version is up top. You should not scheme against, that's how I translate covet. You should not scheme against your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his slaves, his, uh, his animals, or anything that is your neighbor. That's the Exodus version. In Deuteronomy, the wording differs slightly, and the order of things that are off limits is also slightly different. In Deuteronomy, it's the wife that comes first, and then the house, and the slaves, and the animals, and so forth. Now, this made, I think in the Exodus version, we essentially have things stated in their descending order of value. And maybe in Deuteronomy, there was a depressed real estate market or something like that. Um, or maybe, as some have suggested, it was a very modest advance in the status of women. But still, whether placed first or second, the wife is still property. By the way, this, the difference between these two versions in Exodus and Deuteronomy explains the different numbering of the Ten Commandments in um, Jewish and Christian traditions. Jews and most Christians follow the version in Exodus, but uh, Roman Catholics and Lutheran follow the version in Deuteronomy, and so in Roman Catholic and Lutheran counting, this is actually the ninth commandment, and this is the tenth, whereas this is the tenth commandment for most others. Another important variation between the two versions concerns the Sabbath. So in Deuteronomy, the Sabbath reads, remember the Sabbath day to make it holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. You should not do any task. You or your son or your daughter or your male slave or your female slave or your cattle or your resident alien. For in six days the Lord our God, Yahweh, made the heavens and earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested the seventh day. For this reason... Yahweh blessed the day of the Sabbath and made it holy. So this version alludes to the account of creation at the very beginning of Genesis where God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. 
and human beings are to rest in imitation of that divine rest after creation. But Deuteronomy's version is significantly different, especially at the end. So you, sh you should not do any task, you and all these other folks, so that, the bold part here, so that your male slave and your female slave may rest like you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Yahweh, your God, brought you out from there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. For this reason, Yahweh, your God, commanded you to keep the day of the Sabbath. So both versions prescribe Sabbath rest, but give different reasons. And Deuteronomy's reason is a more humanitarian reason. Not working on the seventh day meant that slaves could rest, just as Yahweh had freed the, the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, um, they should treat their slaves humanely by allowing them to rest as well. But both of these versions are in the Bible. And how can we explain the difference between two versions? Why should there be two versions of the Ten Commandments in the Bible? Well, the second, the Deuteronomy version, comes from the end of Moses' life. He was 120 years old, we're told. Maybe his memories, memory was slipping a bit. Um, more likely, however, is that here, as often is the case in the Bible, we have multiple sources, different sources. Surely the final editors of the Bible, and especially of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, knew that these were not identical, and if, had, if they had wanted to, they could have reconciled them, they could have harmonized them. But they did not. And I think one of the reasons was that for them, preserving ancient traditions was more important than a superficial consistency. But the variations also make it likely that the original Sabbath commandment was pithier um, and that there was similar expansion in the other commandments. So we have two versions of the Ten Commandments, one in Exodus 20 and one in Deuteronomy 5. But to complicate matters further, there's a third version. In the book of Exodus, after having gotten the Ten Commandments from God, Moses went back up Mount Sinai and stayed there for the customary 40 days and 40 nights. And as his absence continued, the Israelites became more and more worried, and then they made the golden calf with Aaron's complicity and engaged in a ritual that the narrators hint included a kind of sexual orgy. So back up on top of Mount Sinai, Yahweh knew what was going on, and he told Moses, your people, they are no longer my people, your people have become corrupt. And he said he would destroy them. So Moses reacted as he often did when God was angry. He persuaded God to change his mind. And then Moses went down to straighten things out, carrying the two tablets of the law. But as he gets near the camp and sees what's going on, he himself becomes enraged and smashes the two tablets. Then he destroys the calf and kills the guilty parties except for Aaron. <clears throat> but now Moses has another problem. The original tablets are broken. So following divine instruction, he carves two blanks and goes back up the mountain, and there, this time, God dictates the Ten Commandments to Moses, which Moses, rather than God, wrote on the tablets. And this is how the book of Exodus concludes the passage. Yahweh said to Moses, write, write for yourself these words. And so he wrote on the wor tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Words. So far, so good. We would expect this just to be a duplicate set. But when we look at what follows in Exodus, it's a very different set. Almost all of these commandments have to do with sacrifices, holy days, other religious rituals, including the mysterious ban against boiling a kid in its mother's milk. And so scholars call this text the ritual decalogue. We don't find any of the prohibitions of murder, adultery, or false witness. We don't find the command to honor parents. Um, 
we do find insistence on the exclusive worship of the God of Israel and a prohibition of the making of images in slightly different wording. And we also find, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Uh, we also, do, 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 back, back. Um, we also find a, a Sabbath command. Six days you may work, but on the seventh day you should rest, even in plowing and harvesting times you should rest. And I think it's likely that the first part of this is the original sort of short version of the Sabbath commandment before these later expansions were added in these two versions and maybe even in this version is, is as well. So why is this so-called ritual decalogue here? Well, for the same reason, uh, well, the, the plot requires that this be original, that this replacement set be original to the set that Moses broke. But we, the readers of the Bible, know what was on the first set. We've already been told. And so I think the compilers of the Bible took advantage of the plot detail of the broken tablets to insert yet another version that was in circulation. They were preserving, again, ancient traditions. But not all biblical writers agree with this. So when Deuteronomy retells the story of the golden calf, um, what Moses say, uh, says, Deuteronomy is cast as a speech, a kind of final uh, address by Moses before his death. So he gets instructions. Uh, and so I carved two stone tablets like the first one, and I went up the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. <clears throat> and God wrote on the tablets the same text as before, Deuteronomy said, the ten words that he spoke to you earlier on the mountain. So for the authors of Exodus, it's not the same text, but for the author of Deuteronomy, um, it is the same text. Now... I think the author of Deuteronomy may have been trying to suppress this version, which he probably was familiar with, which therefore means that this version may well be the, one of the oldest versions of the Decalogue. In any case, we have three different versions of the Ten Commandments, indicating that its text was not fixed in ancient Israel. This was not an immutable text. But none of these versions, I think, is the original Decalogue, which I think we can no longer recover. Um, I think maybe the idea of the Ten Commandments, of a Decalogue, of ten words, was an ancient idea, but its form varied. Perhaps as state constitutions have Bill of Rights which overlap with the Bill of Rights to the U.S. Constitution but are often not identical. Anyway, let me return for a moment to public display of the Decalogue. Um, I object to it in principle, that should be clear. But I do have an alternative. If people want to display the Decalogue, I think they should display all three versions. <laughs> and um, te so te people will start to think about how the Bible was formed over time and what that implies for its status as a supreme authority. And the Bible, in the Bible, the Decalogue does have a special status. The fact that we have three different versions suggests this, and it is alluded to in the prophets and elsewhere in the Bible. So once in Deuteronomy, once the Decalogue has been proclaimed, um, Moses continues. These words... Yahweh spoke to your entire assembly on the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness in a loud voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them on the two stone tablets and he gave them to me. That's the first version. Ten Commandments. God wrote them and he added no more. At that point, the people are terrified by all of the sort of fire cloud and all that stuff. And so they tell Moses that from then on, only he should deal directly with God. Um, you should listen to everything that God says, and you should then tell us. So the Ten Commandments were spoken to all the people, 
but everything that follows was spoken only to Moses and then by Moses to the Israelites. So the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy seem to have a kind of special status. And early post-biblical Jewish literature and practice affirm that special status. The first century philosopher Philo, um, in one of his treatises called On the Ten Words, deals with the Decalogue, which he identifies as the principal laws given by God himself directly to the Israelites. The father of all decreed the ten words. These ten words are then elaborated upon in what Philo calls the special laws that follow in the book of Exodus, which were given by God only indirectly to the Israelites, given first to Moses. So the Decalogue for Philo has a special status because it was given by God directly to the Israelites. The other laws were not. This status is also evident in um, early Jewish worship. Rabbinic tradition reports that among the texts recited daily in the temple in Jerusalem before its destruction by the Romans were the Ten Commandments and three other passages from the Torah that were and continued to be central in Judaism as the Shema. Actually, I wanted to go back. So this is the Shema beginning. These texts, the first of these is Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone, and you should love him with all your heart and all yourself and all your might. You should tie these words as a sign on your arms, and they should be pendants between your eyes, and you should write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the mid-20th century, one of the earliest manuscripts containing part of the Jewish scriptures was this papyrus, actually four uh, papyrus fragments that joined together. It's known as the Nash papyrus. It was purchased in Egypt in the late 19th century by the secretary of the Society for Biblical Archaeology, W.L. Nash. It dates to the mid-2nd century BCE. It's about five inches high. So it's a tiny little thing. Um, and it contains much of the Hebrew text. It's not complete but it can easily be reconstructed. Much of the Hebrew text of the Ten Commandments followed by uh, the beginning of the Shema. Now, we don't know what this, the function of this little papyrus fragment was. It may have been from a scroll used in worship, a kind of page from a prayer book or something like that. Or there's an, it could have been a scroll that would have been folded and inserted into the phylacteries, the tefillin, which were attached to the arms and forehead during worship, during prayer. Now, it happens that we have more than three dozen very ancient phylactery containers, such as this one, from Qumran and other uh, sites near uh, the Dead Sea. It's unfortunate that this... Um, photo doesn't have a scale. Um, this is about one and a quarter inches wide. So this is a tiny little thing and it would have been folded over. So the scrolls were placed, as you can see, in the pockets at the bottom. And then this leather pouch was closed and then attached to the body during prayer. Uh, so these are tiny, tiny little scrolls. And several of the scrolls from these to fill in, um, include the Ten Commandments. So the Nash papyrus and these to fill in from Qumran suggest that for at least some Jews of the Second Temple period, um, a kind of canon within the canon, a kind of Torah within the Torah, was the Decalogue and the Shema. Just recently, it was, this is in the news. So in the Israel Museum, there were a lot of these that had never been opened. <laughs> And they just opened up um, some, and they found nine more parchments 
they're, just, they're described as being the size of lentils, and they have to slowly, you know, open them up and read them. It'll be interesting to see if they have the Decalogue too. So I think the Ten Commandments had a special status in Jewish ritual um, and Jewish thought in the late Second Temple period, and that special status is also evident in the New Testament. I include the New Testament as a Jewish source, both because the Gospels are about a Jewish rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, and about a third of the New Testament was written by Paul, who was also Jewish. Of course, the New Testament isn't just a Jewish text. In essence, it is a Christian text uh, written by Jewish Christians and by non-Jewish Christians. In the earliest of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, we're told of an encounter between Jesus and a rich man who asked Jesus, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. The man replies, he's been keeping all these since he was young, so Jesus urges more, sell your property and give to the poor, but he was a rich man, and he was stunned, and he left. Now, Jesus was Jewish to the core, and for him, apparently, I say apparently because we can never be sure whether words attributed to Jesus in the Gospel were actually his, but for him, apparently, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, had a special status. But a funny thing happened on the way to the church. Jesus' earliest followers were all Jews. And the movement that he began was exclusively Jewish, however, for only a short time. Within a few decades after his death, non-Jews, Gentiles, rapidly became a majority of adherents of this Jesus movement, which we know ultimately as Christianity. So there were Jewish Christians and there are Gentile Christians. And the sources that we have make it clear that tension developed between the two groups, although they shared a belief in Jesus as the Messiah. Jewish Christians continued to think of themselves as Jews and observe the requirements of Jewish law, including especially dietary restrictions and circumcision. But for Gentile Christians, becoming Jewish and especially, I think, being circumcised as adults, didn't seem essential to their faith. The leader of the movement to exempt Gentile Christians from the requirements of Jewish law was Paul himself. He was a rabbinically trained Jew. He was an Orthodox, observant Jew. But he also describes himself as an apostle to the Gentiles. And he argued vehemently that Gentiles, although in his metaphor grafted on to the tree of Judaism, not replacing Judaism, but grafted on to the tree of Judaism, Gentiles were not obliged to observe the many details of Jewish law, the Torah, especially concerning circumcision and diet. Paul doesn't reject the general authority of the Torah. In fact, he often cites it in support of his arguments. And he tells us what the essence of Torah was. He says, the whole law is fulfilled in one saying, you should love your neighbor as yourself. This is from his letter to the Galatians, which is a kind of um, first draft of ideas he later develops in the letter to the Romans. So in the letter to the Romans, Paul also cites the Decalogue with approval. Do not owe anyone anything except to love each other, for whoever loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not desire, and every other commandment that exists is summed up in this saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not do wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of law. So here Paul 
distills the essence of the Torah to the second part of the Decalogue, which he quotes, and which he says is summed up in the love of neighbor command found in Leviticus. There's nothing intrinsically surprising about Paul's view in the context of first century Judaism. Uh, in a familiar, often quoted story, Rabbi Hillel, who lived a few decades before Paul, was asked by a would-be proselyte to teach him the Torah as long as he could stay standing on one foot. And Hillel replied, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Likewise, when Jesus was asked what the most important was, he replied with two quotations. The first from the opening words of the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. No commandment is greater than these, Jesus says, according to Mark's gospel. So Hillel, Jesus, Paul, all sort of roughly contemporary rabbis in, are in a sense privileging part of the Torah, but they, that doesn't mean that they thought that the rest of it was no longer binding. But Paul went further. After his um, dramatic revelation on the road to Damascus, according to Acts, he himself continued to be an observant Jew. He worshipped in the temple. He fulfilled a Nazarite vow. But in his view, the prescriptions of the Torah were no longer binding on Gentile Christians, apart from the Decalogue, and its summary in the love of neighbor command. Paul reasoned that like Abraham, before Abraham was circumcised, Gentile Christians were justified by faith apart from the works of the law from which they were now discharged. Why then should the Decalogue be binding on Gentile Christians? Well, Paul said they knew about it. They didn't have to read it in the Torah. What is knowable about God is apparent to them, for God has made it apparent to them. When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, then they, even though they do not have the law, are a law for themselves. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. There is thus a kind of natural law, knowable by all humans, apart from the revelation at Sinai. And in Paul's view, Gentile Christians only had to observe this natural law. Um, the rest of the laws in the Torah didn't apply to them. This concept of natural law is taken up by the late second century Christian writer Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon, and he says, as you can see, at first, God advised them with natural precepts, which he had implanted in humans from the beginning, that is, through the Decalogue. And he required nothing more of them, sounds like um, Deuteronomy, and he said no more. Um, so, according to Irenaeus, the Ten Commandments have been implanted in all persons from the beginning, but they were forgotten. And so God revealed them again to the Israelites. And then, according to Irenaeus, because of their hardness of heart in making the golden calf, he gave them further laws. These precepts of the old covenant, these laws of bondage, as Irenaeus calls them, are no longer binding. The only thing still binding is this natural law which humans have had since they were created. But what this does is to wrench the Ten Commandments from their historical and literary context and to demote the entire revelation on Mount Sinai. There's nothing really special about the laws given to Moses. What really counts are the natural laws, the Ten Commandments, that God, God gave directly to everyone at the very beginning. In a sense, this echoes Philo's privileging of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments are special because God gave them directly to the people. But for Philo, of course, this didn't undermine the authority of the rest of the Torah. So let me say a little bit about this idea of natural law. The last six commandments, 
Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not kidnap, that's how I translate, do not steal. Do not commit perjury, do not um, plot to get control of, covet, in the traditional translation, your neighbor's property. These are the basis of any ordered society. There's nothing, uh, so they, they're natural in a way. But not all of the Decalogue is natural in this way. There's nothing inherently natural as Christian theologians, even early Christian theologians recognized. There's nothing inherently natural about not making images. Almost everybody else did it. Uh, or about observing the Sabbath. Nor, I would add, is monotheism itself necessarily something natural. Most cultures, ancient and some modern, have been polytheistic. So, ever since Paul, Christians have been ambivalent about what they came to call the Old Testament. It is part of Christian Bibles, but it is, following Paul, the laws it contains are letter rather than spirit. Uh, Paul's views were not immediately accepted by everyone, because we find opposing views uh, in the New Testament. Uh, and these, some of these texts, like parts of the Gospel of Matthew and the letter of James, reflect this ongoing tension between Jewish Christians on one side and Paul and his followers on the other. Eventually, the terms of the debate, justification by faith, letter as opposed to spirit, faith without works, would morph into slogans of the Reformation, but slogans that had little to do with their original context. Eventually, Paul's position within Christianity won the day, partly because Gentile Christians soon outnumbered um, Jewish Christians, and also because Jewish Christianity, headquartered in Jerusalem, was considerably weakened, first by the Roman destruction of the city in 70, and then by the Roman defeat of the Second Jewish Revolt in 135. So Christians were no longer obliged to obey all of the commandments of the Decalogue, of the Torah, um, only the Decalogue was binding. And it was binding because it was apparently natural. Um, in response to this Christian insistence that of all the laws given on Sinai, the Decalogue alone was binding, Jewish practice changed. In the late Second Temple period, the Shema and the Ten Commandments had this privileged status. But by the second century, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, are no longer included in the texts of phylacteries and mezuzahs or recited at worship. And the rabbis tell us why. Because of the claims of the heretics, so that they should not say only these were given to him, to Moses at Sinai. Now, the heretics in Hebrew Menim, their precise identity is not clear, but it's likely that among them were Jewish Christians or Christians. And as you know, later Jewish scholars will count some 613 commandments in the Torah, uh, all equally binding, because they all came from God, whether directly or indirectly. Many people, including popes and preachers and pundits, assume that the Ten Commandments are immutable, presumably because they were divinely given. But we've seen that the text of, command, of the Ten Commandments wasn't fixed even in ancient Israel. And although the biblical writers do cloak the various versions of the Ten Commandments with the myth of divine authorship, as is true in much of the rest of the Bible, I think we should scarcely credit a divine author with, with such inconsistency and repetition. Uh, in any case, if there was a proto-decalogue, as it were, it is no longer recoverable. So just as the biblical writers had different versions of the decalogue, we find a similar flexibility in modern times. We've looked at the abridged and watered down version promulgated by the, by the Eagles. And the same is true of the version that I memorized as a child in parochial school in the Baltimore Catechism. 
the standard religious education text for American Catholics from the late 19th to the mid-20th century. In the Baltimore Catechism, the second commandment about graven images is simply dropped. What would American Catholic children and adults think about that prohibition when they walked into their churches? The Baltimore Catechism, like the Eagles version, also leaves out the historical reference to the exodus from Egypt and the punishment of sons for their father's sins, and also leaves out the creation of the world in six days. Um, and it also leaves out the reference to slavery in the last commandment. The, the version I memorized was simply, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. So the text of the commandments was not immutable in biblical times, and it hasn't been immutable ever since. And some of the commandments, at least, have simply been ignored beginning in biblical times. Here's a trivial example. Christians have not taken literally, observed literally, the commandment to rest on the seventh day. The seventh day is Saturday the Sabbath in biblical chronology. And yet most Christians cavalierly change the day without any biblical authorization. Nowhere does the New Testament say time to change the day. Um, so in the Baltimore Catechism version, instead of remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, it's remember the Lord's Day to keep it holy. They um, changed it to something vaguer, perhaps to forestall questions about which was the Sabbath. The same lack of observance is true about images. This commandment, by the way, is unparalleled in much of the ancient Near East. And in ancient Israel itself, it was repeatedly ignored and even broken. So just to give one example, Moses made a bronze serpent, and he's not condemned for it. And following divine specifications, he makes this elaborate throne of Yahweh with cherubim. Um, although the commandment says, you shall not make for yourself an image, a likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. And this disregard of the prohibition of graven images continued in Jewish and Christian history. This is a part of a stunning mosaic floor in a 6th century CE synagogue at Beit Alpha in southern Galilee. Some of you may be familiar with the lower part of this. It shows in a very charming, naive way uh, the near sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. But in this middle panel, it's the most surprising. This is on the floor in the center of a synagogue. So there is the sun god, seated in his chariot drawn by four horses, surrounded by the signs of the zodiac, both human and animal figures, whose names are written in Hebrew. And in the four corners, we have goddesses representing the four seasons. This kind of exuberant representational art is characteristic of many synagogues of the Byzantine period. And obviously Christian examples are too numerous to mention, but you recognize the, uh, the scene from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, my point is obvious. Neither in ancient Israel nor in subsequent Judaism and Christianity was the commandment prohibiting images consistently observed. Sometimes it's rationalized by the argument that you're not worshiping these images, um, but this is a self-serving interpretation, I think, that iconoclasts throughout the ages and Muslims in their sacred places have strenuously insisted meant no images meant no images. There are also values enshrined in the Decalogue that most Jews and Christians have for good reasons abandoned in modern times. The first is slavery, mentioned both in the Sabbath commandment and in the final commandment. I would think that if these laws were originally from a deity who freed Hebrew slaves from Egyptian bondage, he might at least hint that slavery was intrinsically wrong. But we find no such hint. Slaves are to be provided rest on the Sabbath, according to Deuteronomy, 
because the Israelites know what it's like to be a slave, but only rest, not freedom, and they are property. And in the laws that follow, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, slavery is an established institution regulated by divine commands. And because of biblical warrant, um, both Jews and especially Christians would continue to be slave owners for many centuries. Even in the New Testament, slavery is never condemned. And slaves weren't the only people considered property. Women were as well. A woman was the property of the man who controlled her, either her father, first her father, then her husband. You shall not scheme to get control of your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's slave, your neighbor's ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And this implicit value is one that most Jews and Christians, all Jews and Christians, but only in the past century or so have, a bit, have rejected, at least in principle. Now, some of these issues are trivial, others less so. But my point is that from biblical times to the present, different writers and religious authorities at various times and places have revised, expanded, and amended the Decalogue and even disregarded some of its explicit commands and implicit value, even values, even though it was supposedly from God or from Moses or from both. On the exterior of the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., we see three lawgivers in the midst of allegorical figures. So Moses with one tablet in each hand is in the center, flanked on your left by Confucius and on your right by the Greek uh, lawgiver Solon. And Moses is clearly privileged by his size and his position, but remarkably, the tablets that he is holding are blank. The sculptor did not call attention to the actual content of the Decalogue, either its religious or its secular requirements, nor to their divine origin. Moses is the lawgiver. Inside the Supreme Court building, on free friezes of the court chamber, going all the way around, there are great lawgivers of history, a remarkably ecumenical group. Um, all the figures are the same size, so we have, and I'm not showing them all, but we have Confucius, we have Draco, we have Octavian, we have Justinian, we have Muhammad, uh, we have a whole bunch of Europeans, King John, the British legal theorist Blackstone, Napoleon, we have John Marshall from the United States, and here from the ancient Near East, we see uh, the Egyptian the legendary first pharaoh of Egypt, Menes, then uh, Hammurabi, king of Babylon in the second millennium BC. Then Moses, and you can't quite make him out there, but Solomon is sort of lurking in the side there beyond this allegorical figure. Um, so in this parade of famous lawgivers, Moses is just one among many. And the tablets that he is holding, he's holding two, but you can only read the one in front. And that is the one that has the last five commandments, the so-called natural, what I would consider the natural commandments, murder, uh, kidnapping, adultery, and so forth. So the sculptor, there's nothing distinctly Israelite about this. There's no Sabbath. There's no prohibition of images. There's no hint that these laws are divinely given, although people like Hammurabi and Muhammad claimed that their laws, that the laws that they were promulgating were divinely given. For the designers of the Supreme Court, at least, if not for all the justices who sit on the bench, the Decalogue has been stripped of its explicit religious context. It is part of the history of law, but it is not inspired scripture. In my view, the freeze, this freeze provides a kind of model 
about how to publicly recognize the importance of the Ten Commandments in an American context. They are a part of our history. They are part of legal history. They are part of world history. But like the interpretation and observance of the Decalogue, that history has not been static. We are a very different country now than we were in the late 18th century or in 1935 when the Supreme Court building was completed. We are much more diverse, especially religiously. The Ten Commandments, if they were ever set, set in stone, I think should no longer be set in stone for the reasons I have suggested. The insistence by some that the Ten Commandments should be put on display is one side of an ongoing culture war that divides the United States and much of the world about ultimate human values. Defenders of the display of the Ten Commandments, however abridged or altered, suggest that we have infallible answers in an ancient text to complex modern question. And they interpret that text infallibly, inflexibly, excuse me, which is at odds both with the history of the text and with the history of its observance. So I would argue that the display of the Ten Commandments is not only un-American, but contrary to the underlying values of the Bible. And it's those values that matter, not the actual words, with their historically conditioned contents and in their multiple versions. According to the Torah, among the laws God gave to Moses, as we've seen, is this, you should love your neighbor as yourself. In the early second century, Rabbi Akiva said, you should love your neighbor as yourself, is the greatest principle in the Torah. That principle has informed our society's best instincts, freeing slaves, empowering women, welcoming immigrants, caring for the poor and the powerless, and considering all persons as equal. And it can, this principle can continue to inform us as we strive to love all of our neighbors as they are, here and throughout the world, regardless of their age, their gender, their sexual orientation, their ethnicity, their national origin, their social status, their religious beliefs, or lack of them. That is how to honor the Ten Commandments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for that fascinating overview. Uh, if you have some questions, Michael has uh, agreed to answer some of those before we uh, go to our reception next door at the Smith Museum. Michael? Sure. It's, uh, you touched on a question that I wondered about the Ten Years. What is the official uh, Christian justification for having great images, having images in the church? So the Christian. Christians read the commandments as though they are connected. You should not make for yourself an image and you should not bow down to them and serve them, worship them. You can make an image of God. You shouldn't have other gods and then you shouldn't make images of other gods. And so Christians would say there's nothing wrong with making an image of God. You're not worshiping the image. You're worshiping God who it represents. And if it's saints or angels or whatever, you're not worshiping them, you're venerating them. But that's a very sort of nice uh, distinction that I think is, as I said, most iconoclasts throughout the ages have found. You walk into you know, a congregational church in every New England uh, town, no stained glass windows, no statues, not even the body of Jesus on a cross. The Puritans interpreted that commandment literally. Sure. Are there other lists of comparable commandments from other Middle Eastern civilizations? Well, there are many lists of laws. 
Uh, but none have, uh, that I'm aware of, have the, the, the status, the sort of special status of the Ten Commandments. So Hammurabi's law code contains some 300 laws, dealing as biblical laws do with all sorts of matters of property and uh, personal injury and so forth. Um, but not one of, not, there's no sort of subset of those laws that is more important than, than the rest of them. Yeah. It means the Hebrew word means murder. It means what we would call first degree premeditated murder. Ah, okay. So okay. That, is, that is the proper translation. Yeah. Yes. Now, so, uh, yeah, well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that, so uh, pacifists on the one hand will say that thou shalt not kill means you shouldn't take human life in war, for example. Well, that's certainly not very biblical because the Israelites are repeatedly instructed by God to kill all their enemies, men, women, and children. Okay, Our God instructs them. Um, in the abortion debate, um, People who are opposed to abortion, to abortion, say, um, "Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder." The the abortion of a fetus is, in effect, murder because the fetus is a person. Well, that's a different argument, um, but the murder understanding would work in defense of that position. It's odd, though, not just in that case, but in so many cases, as with slavery, that people on both sides of a very complex issue will both quote the Bible in support of their contradictory positions. How do you determine the proper translation of the word basically is valid? Well, we, um, Hebrew has had a long history to start with, and there are other very closely related languages that use the same or related <coughs> words. And because we have a significant body of literature in the Bible, we have enough context to make it clear. So there are laws that talk about taking of life by accident. So we know what words mean from ancient times, partly because they have, they have a history in their own times and because we have context that enable us to determine. I'm curious about this, this idea that the uh, commandments as originally written were, were much shorter. It, it sometimes we, we see this part about the ten words. Right. Uh, if it's ten words, it, it seems like there's almost nothing to hang. Well, it's not ten words literally. Okay. okay. It's not ten words literally. I mean, you can't, in Hebrew at least, you know, you shall not commit murder. You should not commit murder is two words uh -huh. all by itself. Not a murder. Um, don't murder would be a, a literal translation of that. So in Hebrew, the word word doesn't necessarily mean just a single vocable, but it could be a sentence. Um, in Jewish tradition, however, the ten words, the first word, the first commandment, is not a prohibition, but it's the introductory statement. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt from out of the house of slaves. That's the first word, and it's not a command. It's a word. And the term ten commandments is not used in the Bible at all. It's always the Ten Words. Usually translators will say the Ten Commandments, but literally it's the Ten Words. I missed what you said about um, uh, the, the commandments being directly given to the Israelites, the people, not just indirectly. Right. So God proclaims them from Mount Sinai, and they all hear it. When and after that, according to Deuteronomy, they are so terrified by this theophany that they say to Moses, we don't want God to talk to us anymore. You go talk to him and tell us what he says. <laughs> That's in Exodus. That's in Deuteronomy. And it's similar in Exodus. It's not quite as clear in Exodus, but that clearly that's what Deuteronomy suggests. One, so one, fi one final question. Yeah. And you mentioned there was an image of the Trinity on the, on the dollar bill. The triangle. The triangle. And then also the president and other officials swear on the Bible. Well, how do you feel about the extent of your position on the Ten Commandments to those other types of images? I don't 
see any problem with people swearing on the Bible or the Quran or, you know, the um, Book of Mormon or whatever they want to. I really don't have a personal problem with that. I wouldn't choose to do it myself. Um, there is, I mean, we have this complex relationship in our system where, you know, every session of Congress is open with a prayer and God we trust is written everywhere and things like that. And I wonder how my Hindu neighbors or my Muslim neighbors or my atheist neighbors or other neighbors of mine feel about that in this much more and more pluralistic context in which we live. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Thank you. If